My name is Spencer Fluman. I am the uh, executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute here on campus, and I am pleased on behalf of all of us at the Institute to welcome you to our guest lecture today. First off, I have a potentially annoying request because we are almost full in the venue. If you want to squeeze together toward the middle of those rows, those are not uh, really roomy rows, and folks coming late, jumping over you will be a, an event to see indeed. Wonderful. Fantastic work. I'm impressed that you pulled that off. So glad to have you here. Um, I wanted to just have you all, uh, most folks tell you to put away your phones. I'm going to tell you to take yours out. Uh, you're going to follow us on Twitter. You're going to follow us on Instagram. You're going to go to mi.byu.edu, and you're going to sign up for our monthly newsletter. If you choose not to, that's OK. But if you want to, now would be a good time. We're, we're eager to have you aware of what we're doing at the Institute. Uh, we have a steady stream of uh, interesting events and speakers, and we want you involved. Please join our uh, circle of friends. We'd love to have you. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, as is our custom at BYU, we're going to begin today's event with a prayer, and we've invited Grace Solberg, a BYU undergraduate a majoring in history, to offer that prayer for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here at BYU today and to come to this amazing lecture. Please bless that our hearts and minds will be open and that we'll be able to fill the spirit as we learn about an amazing member of the church. And again, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, amen. We're honored today to have uh, visiting our, our campus community, Dr. Quincy D. Newell. She's an associate professor of religious studies at Hamilton College in central New York State, where she teaches courses on all aspects of American religion. She's an expert in religion in the American West and has published extensively in that field. Her recent research has focused on the construction and experience of racial and religious identities in, in the 19th century Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She's active in the subfield of Mormon studies. She recently finished a term on the board of the Mormon History Association. She's the founder of Women in Mormon Studies, and she is co-editor of the Mormon Studies Review. Her uh, lecture today uh, treats uh, par portions of her new book from Oxford University Press. We've got copies of that book available outside this venue for purchase, if anyone would like to purchase it after the event. She's also willing to take questions for a time after her lecture today, but please uh, help me welcome Dr. Quincy Newell. I am so excited to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I really want to thank the Maxwell Institute for bringing me out from New York, um, and particularly Spencer Fluman, um, Blair Hodges, who I got to talk to for the podcast this morning, um, and Camille Messick, who did all of the sort of arrangements for my visit. Um, I'm excited to be here today. So in 1902, a journalist described the role of newspapers as, quote, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, unquote. It took, surprisingly, over half a century before this catchy phrasing got applied to Christian churches by none other than the redoubtable scholar of American religion, Martin E. Marty, who described the priestly and prophetic roles of religion as alternately comforting the afflicted, the priestly aspect, and afflicting the comfortable, the prophetic aspect. I'm borrowing the phrase today to think about how we can shake up our standard historical narratives, our comfortable history, so that we can gain new insights. 
So today I want to talk to you, with you, about a woman whose story has been used both to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable, Jane Elizabeth Manning James. Perhaps you've heard of Jane James. She was an African-American woman from Connecticut who, as a young woman in the early 1840s, joined the movement that became the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. James's story is not, at this point, foundational to the LDS narrative. You could easily tell the story of the 19th century LDS church without mentioning her, though she is one of the go-to figures for humanizing discussions of race. So Tom Alexander's book, recent book about Brigham Young is a good example here. Still, Jane James didn't make church policy. She was merely one of the many people affected by it. Whoa. <laughs> Nevertheless, James's story is intriguing to me because it gives us such a different angle on what it meant to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the 19th century. My dad loves presidential history, and I promise this is only sort of a tangent. He's read all of Robert Caro's books on Lyndon B. Johnson, and those are doorstops. He's read Doris Kearns Goodwin's books, Team of Rivals, and the like. But imagine if the only history of the United States you knew was from the point of view of its chief executives. You would know a lot, but it's a very narrow story. Now, I'm more interested in other kinds of people. I have read, for fun, books by Jill Lepore about Benjamin Franklin's sister and about the guy who created Wonder Woman, a book by Erica Armstrong Dunbar about an enslaved woman who ran away from George and Martha Washington. My dad and I are reading about the same time periods, but we're getting very different stories because we're looking at that history from very different points of view. We've seen the value of this strategy in fiction as well. Has anybody seen or read Wicked? <laughs> Some of you have, okay. So Wicked retells the wonderful Wizard of Oz from the point of view of the Wicked Witch of the West, and we learn that she's a much more interesting, relatable character than we initially thought. Alice Randall's The Wind Done Gone retells Gone with Wind from the point of view of an enslaved woman belonging to Scarlett O'Hara. And so many others, from kids' books to high literature, use this strategy. Change the point of view, and the story changes. To really appreciate stories like this to the fullest, we have to consider multiple perspectives. It's not enough for my dad to know presidential history and for me to know the history of the little people. It works best when we can interweave those stories. So I often tell people that Jane James is like the Forrest Gump of 19th century Mormonism, not to compare them in terms of mental capacity, but because in the same way that Forrest Gump's story gives us a different angle on 20th century American history, Jane James's life gives us a new way of looking at 19th century Mormon history. So today, I want to think about how James's experience fits into the Mormon story, where the main characters are usually white and generally male. I'm going to talk about some difficult episodes in Mormon history, some things that might feel embarrassing. Please know that I'm not here to attack or tear down the LDS church. Instead, I want to use these moments to explore how James's racial identity made her religious experience fundamentally different from that of white Latter-day Saints, and to think about how her experience helps us, you, me, scholars, students, church members, non-members, how Jane James's experience helps all of us expand our understanding of what it means to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. About a year after Jane James joined the Latter-day Saint movement, she and her family sold their house in Wilton, Connecticut, and joined an interracial group of converts led by Charles Wesley Wandell for the journey to Nauvoo. Were you to take this trip today, using the modern interstate highway system, you would drive for about 1,080 miles, a touch over 16 hours, according to Google Maps. Wandell and company, of course, were not driving on the modern interstates. They were taking the modern conveyances of their time, canal boats, steamships, and the like. The group would have left from Norwalk, Connecticut, where Wandell's mission was centered, and headed down to catch a packet boat to New York City. There, they almost certainly boarded a steamboat heading up the Hudson River. This method of travel was fast for its time and convenient, though it did carry some risks, 
Steamboats, for example, were uncomfortably prone to blowing up. <laughs> Steamboats were also segregated by race. Earlier parts of the journey may have been integrated, we can't really tell. But for this leg, James and her family would have been put on the forward deck, windier, wetter, and colder than other parts of the boat. The rest of the group, the white folks, could be inside and in areas outside that were more protected from the elements. The segregated accommodations likely continued to be the norm when Wondell's group disembarked at Albany. There, they would have taken a train to Schenectady and then gotten on a canal boat to travel the length of the Erie Canal to Buffalo. At Buffalo, or possibly somewhat later in Ohio, the situation went from bad to worse for James and the other black members of the group. James later remembered, quote, we were to go to Columbus, Ohio before our fares were to be collected, but they insisted on having the money at Buffalo and would not take us farther, unquote. Now, let's pause for a moment and take a closer look at that statement. We were to go to Columbus, Ohio before our fares were to be collected, but they insisted on having the money at Buffalo and would not take us farther. There are a number of items here that are crying out for further explanation. First of all, Columbus? Columbus is not on the way from Wilton to Nauvoo, at least not if Buffalo is on your itinerary. There are a couple of possibilities here. One is that from Buffalo, the plan was to take a steamship and then connect with the Ohio Canal system. Going that way, Columbus makes sense as a route to the Mississippi River. Another possibility is that James's Ohio geography in the early 1900s when she was telling this story was about as good as mine in the early 2000s when I first encountered this story, which is to say, not great. She may have meant Cleveland when she, meant, when she said Columbus. If you don't know Ohio, as I confess that I do not know it well, they're not hard to confuse. But this geographical question should not distract us from the larger issue that James's statement seems to gloss over. Here it is again. We were to go to Columbus, Ohio before our fares were to be collected, but they insisted on having the money at Buffalo and would not take us farther. So let's imagine that you are going from Buffalo to Columbus or Cleveland, I don't really care. It's 2019 and you're in a hurry, so you fly. Or you're worried about climate change, so you hire a sailboat. Either way, you book passage, you climb aboard, you head out. In our world, you have probably paid ahead of time. But even if you haven't, even if your fare was to be collected upon arrival, as James's was, your financial situation is unlikely to change so dramatically en route that if you could not pay when you departed, you would be able to pay when you arrived. James was not the dine and dash sort, or in this case, the float and flee sort. I think it's highly unlikely that she planned to sneak off the boat to avoid paying. So this story does not add up. To me then, James's statement that she and her family were denied passage because they were unable to pay up front seems to be covering up some other story, some uglier story. It's striking that the actors here are nameless. They're not even described in terms of their occupations. It's just they. They insisted on having the money. They would not take us farther were left to speculate who they were. Were they the staff of the boat? Law enforcement officials? Charles Wandell himself? Ohio had a pretty draconian black code, a set of laws governing the lives of black people in the state. It required that black people post a bond when they entered and provided for fines if they did not. This may have been the money that someone was asking for up front before helping James and her family get to Ohio. It may not have been an expense that James and her family had budgeted for. And the experience of being singled out, requiring to pay an extra exorbitant fee based solely on her skin color, being able to, unable to come up with the money, feeling isolated, cheated, looked down upon, abandoned, that experience was probably not one that James was eager to revisit. I think that reluctance, along with a reluctance to make other people look bad, helps us make more sense out of this story. So James and her family walked the rest of the way to Nauvoo. 
They might have started walking from Buffalo or possibly from Akron or Cleveland. Her accounts vary. No matter their starting point, though, they hiked for hundreds of miles. They must have looked like fugitive slaves. They were probably wearing shoes from New Canaan, the town where James had worked before, a town that had developed a bit of a specialty in shoemaking. One of the largest producers of shoes in New Canaan made a sturdy model of shoe that sold well locally. My guess is that this is the sort of shoe that James and her family were wearing. It's the same model of shoe that the manufacturers sold to southern plantation owners for enslaved people's use in the fields. James remembered that she and her family, quote, walked until our shoes were worn out and our feet became sore and cracked open and bled until you could see the whole print of our feet with blood on the ground, unquote. James also remembered that, quote, at Peoria, Illinois, the authorities threatened to put us in jail to get our free papers, unquote. She protested ignorance, quote, we didn't know at first what he meant, for we had never been slaves, unquote. That was a small lie. James's mother, who was traveling with her, had been enslaved before James was born. But the group didn't, likely didn't have free papers, and there would have been no way to get them so far away from Wilton, Connecticut. The demand for free papers is not surprising. Illinois also had an extensive black code. But let's just pause and acknowledge the racism inherent in the idea of free papers. The assumption behind them was that black people by default are unfree. They needed documents to prove the opposite. And only black people were asked for such documents. White people could travel without restriction. Black people traveling became targets for harassment by law enforcement and anyone else who felt the need to assert white supremacy. James and her family walked through rivers, through forests, through frost. They stayed in abandoned houses and slept in the open air. They depended on the kindness of strangers for food. They carried their belongings on their backs. They looked like fugitive slaves. When James left Wilton, she had a trunk of clothing. When she and her family were denied passage, she sent the trunk with Charles Wandell, the missionary leading the group. He was to take it to Nauvoo. Wandell made it to Nauvoo, but the trunk did not. Now, many of us have dealt with lost luggage at some point or another, but the items in this trunk were James's way of marking herself as different from fugitive slaves. She owned things, quote, one large trunk full of clothes of all descriptions, mostly new, unquote, she said. The loss of the trunk tore at James's sense of self, at her self-presentation. If all she owned was the clothing she wore, how could she show others that she was different? So for many people, the doctrine of the gathering posed a difficult challenge, but few of them had to deal with the particular challenges of traveling while black in the 19th century. That specific difficulty did not fully end when James and her family reached Nauvoo. She said in her autobiography that they faced hardship, trial, and rebuff upon arriving in the city. She did not say, but we know from other records, that Charles Wandell was brought up on charges of unchristian-like conduct for abandoning the black members of his group at Cleveland. He was not convicted, though, and I think that's in large part because nobody testified against him. Consider the incentives. What would James and her family gain by testifying against the missionary who converted them? Not much. But what might they lose? Their place in Nauvoo was precarious. Could they risk testifying against a white man? James also described the warm welcome she, she and her family received from Joseph and Emma Smith. Quote, Sister Emma was standing in the door, she recalled, and she kindly said, come in, come in. Meanwhile, Joseph Smith made clear that James and her family were welcome. James remembered, quote, Brother Joseph said to some white sisters that was present, Sisters, I want you to occupy this room this evening with some brothers and sisters that have just arrived, unquote. James talked incessantly about how good Joseph Smith was to her. I think she was telling the truth as she understood it, but I think she was telling this truth. Joseph Smith, a white man and a prophet of God, was good to her, a black woman and an ordinary church member, because she knew her audience which was largely composed of white church members who cared deeply about emulating Joseph Smith's example. And she wanted to, them to follow his example, embracing her, rather than Charles Wandell's example, abandoning her. 
Jane James sought and received two patriarchal blessings during her life. One was given to her by Hiram Smith in Nauvoo. The other was given by Patriarch John Smith in Salt Lake in 1889. Both were deeply important to James. The evidence suggests that she treasured these blessings and meditated upon them after receiving them for the rest of her life. But these blessings were not as unequivocally beneficent as we might imagine. <clears throat> Hiram Smith's blessing informed James that she was the recipient of a, quote, promise through the father of the new world that was handed down, quote, in the lineage of Canaan, the son of Ham, unquote. Unlike most patriarchal blessings, which identified their recipients as members of one of the 12 tribes of Israel, usually as members of the tribe of Ephraim, James's blessing reached back to a period of biblical history that predated Ephraim. At the same time, Hiram Smith saddled James with all the racial assumptions of 19th century America, connecting her spiritual lineage to the biblical figure of Canaan, whom Noah had cursed to be a servant of servants and who white Americans and Europeans identified as one of two important biblical ancestors of black people. Smith compounded the racialized references a few sentences later when he reassured James that, quote, he that changeth times and seasons and placed a mark upon your forehead can take it off and stamp upon you his own image, unquote. Smith's reference to the mark upon James's forehead clearly linked her to the biblical figure of Cain. Here again, Smith drew on white Christians' racial folklore, which held that the dark skin of African-descended people was the mark of Cain and visual proof of black people's descent from the biblical first murderer. Even as he held out the possibility of release from these biblical curses with the suggestion that God might stamp upon her his own image, Smith invoked the very Bible stories that white Christians used to justify their oppression of black people. James was trapped. She could not get a blessing without receiving a curse. John Smith's blessing, some 45 years later, was more sanguine, but it still speaks to a separation between James and her community. Reading it now, one gets the sense that James was down, in need of encouragement. Quote, I say unto thee, be of good faith and of good cheer, Smith told James. God has witnessed thy trials, and although thy life has been somewhat checkered, his hand has been over thee for good, and thou shalt verily receive thy reward, he assured her. Although thy life has been somewhat checkered. It's a striking caveat in an otherwise pretty upbeat blessing. It seems to speak to the community's understanding of James, a woman with a checkered past, a child she had out of wedlock, a husband she divorced, a family that had by and large left the church. It cuts through the public image she constructed and puts her in her place, on the outside, hoping someday to come in. Just as her patriarchal blessings seem to promise belonging and acceptance, and yet to keep James at arm's length, so too did the church's leader, church leadership's limited concessions to James regarding temple privileges express a similar ambivalence. In 1875, Jane James, her second husband, Frank Perkins, and several other African-American Latter-day Saints went to the endowment house one fine September day to do baptisms for their dead. Following Brigham Young's instructions, the baptisms performed that day were recorded in a separate book entitled Record of Baptisms for the Dead of the Seed of Cain or the, of the People of African Descent. James and other African-Americans were welcomed into the church but kept at arm's length. They and their dead were acknowledged a part of the body of Christ, but recorded in a separate book, not fully connected to the rest of the human family. In the last decades of her life, James tried to stabilize her position in the LDS community by drawing on the promises she believed Joseph Smith had made to her. Smith was long dead. Emma Smith had also died. But James said that through Emma, Joseph had offered to adopt James into the Smith family as a child. James had initially declined. She didn't understand then in the 1840s what by the late 19th century had become clear to her, that adoption into the Smith family was the most effective way to secure her position in the post-mortal life. But now she said she did understand and she wanted very much to take Joseph up on his offer. 
When James started making this request to be sealed to Joseph Smith as a child, she was one of throngs of Latter-day Saints asking for the same thing. James was different from her fellow petitioners in two ways that I think were important. First, she actually knew and interacted with Joseph Smith while he was alive. That status should have bolstered James's request to be sealed to Joseph Smith. But the other difference between James and others who requested sealing to Joseph Smith, of course, was that she was black. And that turned out to be the factor that had the biggest impact on the disposition of her request. While white Latter-day Saints were sealed to Joseph Smith by the tens, if not the hundreds, Jane's request to be sealed as a child was denied over and over and over again. Nobody directly disputed James's story that Joseph Smith had offered through Emma to adopt James, James as a daughter. By the time she told this story in the 1880s and later, there were no surviving witnesses. There was and is no corroborating evidence to confirm James's story. We do know that adoption sealings were not well understood in the Nauvoo period, and we think that no adoption sealings were performed during Joseph Smith's lifetime. The understanding of adoption sealings certainly evolved over the course of James's lifetime. So what Joseph and Emma offered her, if they actually offered adoption, may have meant something very different at the time of the offer than it did a half century later when James tried to accept the offer. That said, I don't think James completely invented this story. I think she was telling the truth as she remembered and understood it. The Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, I think, couldn't wrap their heads around the idea of giving Joseph Smith a black daughter in eternity. In their experience, that was not what families were supposed to look like. But James was persistent. I have no evidence, but I suspect she may have taken to heart Jesus' parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18, who just kept bothering the unjust judge until he gave her justice against her adversary. And somewhat like that widow, James eventually got the Quorum of the Twelve to give her what she requested, sort of. Worn down by James's requests, the Twelve ultimately decided that James could be sealed to Joseph Smith, but not as a daughter. Instead, they created a new ceremony to attach her to Smith as a servitor. That ceremony was performed on May 18, 1894, just over 125 years ago, in the Salt Lake Temple, not far from where Jane James lived at the time. But James was not allowed to be there. Instead, Zina D.H. Young stood as a proxy for James, even though James was alive and well and nearby. James, you see, was allowed to do proxy baptisms in the temple, but she was not allowed to set foot in the temple any further than the baptistry. As early as 1852, Brigham Young had articulated what scholars have come to call the priesthood ban, a term we usually use to indicate the prohibition on ordaining men of African descent, which lasted from the middle of the 19th century all the way up until 1978. But Jonathan Stapley's work has helped me understand how and why this priesthood ban also implied a temple restriction that kept James from attending and participating in her own sealing. Stapley explains that for early Latter-day Saints, sealing rituals made heaven a material reality. And he writes, quote, those who participated in this temple liturgy during Joseph Smith's lifetime commonly referred to themselves as well as this material network of heaven as the priesthood." Unquote. That understanding persisted through much of the rest of the 19th century. A temple ceiling drew those sealed into the cosmological priesthood, into that material heaven. To participate in temple rituals, endowments, and ceilings was to gain access to the priesthood, which Latter-day Saints' racial mythology of the time prohibited for those people believed to be Cain's posterity. Thus, for James to have been present at her sealing to Joseph Smith as a servant would have allowed her to participate in the priesthood in a way that the priesthood ban precluded. Neither the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles nor James found the compromise of sealing her as a servant satisfactory. The ritual was never performed again, so far as we know, indicating that the Quorum of the Twelve did not find it a useful way to arrange relationships in eternity. And James went back to petitioning for sealing to Joseph Smith as a child. The priesthood ban was lifted by revelation in 1978. That's canonized in the DNC as official declaration too. 
And the racial mythology that undergirded the priesthood ban has officially been disavowed, but it shaped Jane James's experience of her identity as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in profound ways. Jane James told her story in particular ways for particular reasons. I've already talked about some of the ways she shaped her message, like her focus on Joseph Smith and the ways he welcomed her. That was part of the way I think Jane James stayed on message, her overall message being that she too was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that she belonged, and that in fact she belonged at the very center of the church. She certainly conveyed that message with this photograph. This photograph is very much like other photographs made in this studio run by an English immigrant named Edward Martin. We see a similar format and the reuse of many props here. That uh, tablecloth in particular is quite distinctive. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of elements that Jane James herself either controlled or had input on. First, her clothing. All of us have sat at one point or another for a photograph, right? Um, a family portrait, a school picture, a senior portrait maybe, or a professional photo. We've all thought about what to wear in order to convey the appropriate impression. James here was subtle, tasteful, understated. She conformed to Latter-day Saint values, which emphasized modesty and self-sufficiency. At the same time, the details here let the viewers know that James was not poor, reinforcing her distance from the institution of slavery. The reflection of the light marked this fabric as high quality. The subtle embellishments of the dress, on the dress were in good taste and would have taken both time and skill, for which James would have paid. There's no evidence to suggest that she was a skilled seamstress. Her earrings, similarly, were modest, but not strictly necessary adornments. They bespoke her status as a consumer of high quality goods. Second, and this is a shout out to Janice Johnson. Notice the book on the table underneath James's forearm. This is a small detail that would have been barely visible in the original prints of this image, which were carte de visite size. So they were about three, quarter, three and a quarter inches high and two and a half inches wide. Um, looking at Edward Martin's other photographs, we see that this book is not a standard prop. It doesn't show up in other photographs. So it was probably something that James brought with her to the studio. It appears to have gilt edges, a treatment that was reserved for the most important books in one's collection. And it's not big enough, I don't think, to be a Bible. So my guess is that this is a copy of the Book of Mormon or possibly the Doctrine and Covenants. James's inclusion of this volume in her portrait suggested both her literacy and her piety, conveying an impression of her as an upstanding member of her church. In the late 1860s, when this photograph was taken, photography was a bit of a national obsession in the United States. Think of these photographs as like selfies, right? Everyone was having their portrait made. People used their images or images of others as calling cards, and among middle-class Americans, it was virtually required that one have and display images of one's family members. So we might interpret James's decision to have her portrait made and its formal similarity to other portraits made in Edward Martin's studio as an indication that James was allowed to participate in the predominantly white Salt Lake society without regard to her racial difference. That might be how we want to interpret this image of James as well. After being welcomed into the home of Joseph and Emma Smith when she and her family reached Nauvoo, James ended up staying on at the Smith home as a domestic servant. There, James had her most direct encounters with the divine. While doing laundry, she went into a trance state and received information about temple ceremonies. Living with the Smiths, she was taken into confidence and told about the practice of polygamy well before it was taught publicly. James felt welcome in the Smith home. For the rest of her life, she told stories about her time living with the founding prophet. She emphasized his kindness to her, describing her bond with him as almost familial. Quote, he'd always smile, always just like he did to his children, she said. He used to be just like I was his child. I did not talk much to him, but every time he saw me, he would say, God bless you, and pat me on the shoulder, unquote. 
In the latter part of the 19th century, Latter-day Saints sought out James's stories of their founding prophet as the people who had interacted with him in life became fewer and further between. James told these stories to satisfy her co-religionists' need to remember their founder, to commemorate his life and learn from his example. But she also told these stories to position herself at the center of the Mormon story. Who, after all, could be more central than the founding prophet? And who could be closer to him than someone who lived in his house, who literally handled his dirty laundry? Can you see her now? Right in the middle there. Let's see if I can use my laser pointer effectively. There's her face. After Joseph Smith was killed, James went to work for Brigham Young. James and her family were in one of the first companies to arrive in the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. She had gotten married to another black church member at that point and had a couple more children um, as well. Jane James and her husband Isaac both worked for Brigham Young in Salt Lake, but they did eventually establish a family agricultural operation living on the outskirts of the city. They did pretty well for themselves economically in the 1850s and 1860s. But in 1870, Jane and Isaac James divorced. Isaac James left Salt Lake. Jane James moved to a home more centrally located in the city and in many ways threw herself into religious life. She went to worship services regularly, but she also went to women's meetings. She spoke in tongues, which was a pretty normal thing to do at the time. She did faith healings, and she bore her testimony to her co-religionists. She apparently married again for a few years, but that relationship didn't last. When James told the story of her life, she never mentioned her divorce, nor did she mention her second marriage. She talked about her status as a mother and a grandmother. She gave birth to at least eight children. But she did not talk about having her first son out of wedlock, and she did not talk about her children's general failure to stay in the LDS church. She described herself as a widow even before Isaac James or her second husband uh, died, and she tried really hard to fit into the boxes that Mormonism provided to demonstrate in her life the qualities that Mormonism said it valued in women, purity, piety, domesticity, and industry. And for these qualities and for her proximity to Joseph Smith, Jane James's community did accord her a measure of respect. She and her brother, who later came to live with her, were given reserved seats in the Salt Lake Tabernacle. She was called on in women's meetings, and her remarks were listened to and recorded. She was well known in the community and sought after for her memories. She positioned herself at the center of the Mormon community. Looking at this group of 1847 pioneers, photographed 50 years later in 1897, it's easy to imagine James wading into the center of the group, positioning herself right smack dab in the middle. But she was also kept at arm's length by the community, which I think this photo taken in 1905 illustrates beautifully. Jane James was well known in Salt Lake. She was often referred to as Aunt Jane or sometimes Auntie Jane. Now, this might seem to be a mark of respect, but when a white person refers to a black person as aunt or uncle, things get problematic. The failure to use James's last name suggested a lower, perhaps dependent, social status. And aunt was the term traditionally used by whites to refer to a black mammy. Think Aunt Jemima. The term aunt marked the mammy's superiority to other servants while not granting her the authority entailed in the title mistress. In Connecticut, where James grew up, scholar Frank Stone wrote that, quote, slaves were called by their first names with aunt or uncle preceding if they were older, well-liked, and respected in the dominant white community, unquote. A great example is an unsigned 1906 article in the Salt Lake Herald on the annual Old Folks Day excursion. They did these like annually in Salt Lake and elsewhere. Um, and the stories are fantastic. <laughs> the author here consistently referred to white women using their surnames preceded by Miss or Mrs. As in, Miss C.R. Savage drew a picture of Mrs. Margaret Hart. Jane James, on the other hand, appeared as Auntie. Auntie Jane wore a spotless white waist, little poke bonnet, and white apron." Unquote. 
Jane James died in 1908. She had outlived all but two of her children. Her story was largely forgotten in the LDS Church until 1978. After the 1978 revelation, all of the temple ceremonies that Jane James had requested in life, including sealing to Joseph Smith as a child, were performed on her behalf by proxy. The standard image of Jane James, whenever her story is told, is that 1860s portrait made in Edward Martin's studio. It makes sense. We're pretty sure that it's Jane James. It's a good image, and there's something comfortable about it. The format is familiar to us. But I think that the 1847 Pioneers photos are in many ways a much better illustration of her life. Whereas the studio portrait shows us a woman in isolation, separate from the social, political, and religious contexts that shaped her life, one group photo shows James in the midst of those contexts, surrounded by white faces, barely visible among all the other details. And the other shows her as a part of the group, but kept on the margins. In many ways, James is a marginal figure in the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But as I said earlier, she's also a bit like Forrest Gump. She knew all the powerful people. I need my last page. She showed up in the background of all the important moments. She and figures like her help us get a different angle of vision on the church's history. They help us understand why the church is compelling to and how it's experienced by people who don't have all the power and influence. For scholars like me, it's easy to get comfortable with a standard narrative of history, sort of like my dad is comfortable reading presidential history. If we're accustomed to thinking about the story of the LDS Church through the lives of the people like the ones whose names are on the buildings here at BYU, looking at Jane James's story is a healthy affliction. James's life helps us see how elements that we might think of as purely cultural, elements like racism, manifest themselves in religious contexts and shape everyone's experiences in ways that can be difficult to detect if we concentrate only on the main characters. If we care about understanding history, if we care about getting the details right, I think that's an affliction that we should embrace. Thank you very much. So I think we have some time for questions, if anybody has one. All the way in the back. Yeah, thank you for, uh, thank you for all of that. Um, I was talking about the term American in the title of, the, uh, of your talk today. Mm -hmm. It does make sense as a question. I'm afraid I don't have much of an answer for you because I haven't worked on um, sort of 19th century black figures in predominantly white churches in other traditions. Um, although I think there are some folks around here who have. Um, I, I think you're right to, to say that there is a kind of American element to the story and she would have been spared a lot of the particulars of this, um, this set of uh, pain, let's say, um, had she decided to join the AME church instead, for example. Um, the AME church is a predominantly black church, African, African Methodist Episcopal church. Um, it was founded shortly before she was born. Um, she grew up in Wilton, Connecticut, which was predominantly white. Um, and so although the AME church and the AME Z church um, were not terribly far away as the crow flies, um, she was worlds away in terms of her life experience. She was living um, in a place where there weren't a whole lot of black people, 
Um, she joined the Congregational Church before she joined the Mormon movement. Um, and that church was segregated by race as well. Um, so she was welcomed in. There were other black people in that church. Um, but she probably sat in a place that was reserved for black people in the New Canaan Congregational Church. Um, so she would have had similar kinds of experiences, I think, in many uh, predominantly white churches. Um, the, the difference, I think, is temple access. Um, that's not an issue in most white Protestant churches, um, whereas for Latter-day Saints, that's a big, big deal. Um, and so Jane James constructs her religious identity and her religious experience sort of in the absence of temple ceremonies, right? And so instead, she is speaking in tongues, she's doing faith healings, she's having all these charismatic experiences. And those give her a sense of divine favor, the, a sense that God is um, com connecting with her and communicating with her and on her side. Um, so I think probably had she joined some other predominantly white church, she would have um, had less sort of structural barrier um, to overcome. She would have experienced a lot of the same kind of racist um, sort of day-to-day -day -day behavior. Um, so, yeah. Does that answer your question? That's great. Thank you. Great. I have a two-part question. Okay. Uh, did she uh, ask to receive her endowment and be sealed to her children? And does she leave any indication of what her attorney would be like? Um, so she did ask to receive her endowment over and over and over again, yes. Um, she never actually asked to be sealed to her children, no. Um, she did ask to be sealed in marriage, um, and she requested at one point to be sealed in marriage to a man named Walker Lewis, who was also an African-American Mormon who did hold the priesthood during Joseph Smith's lifetime. I think she may have seen that as a way to overcome some of the church leaders' hesitance about sealing her in the temple. If they could seal her to somebody who was black and somebody who was a priesthood holder, maybe that would work. Um, it didn't. Um, she asked to be sealed to Joseph Smith as a child. She asked for her brother to be sealed to Joseph Smith as a child. Um, but she never sort of, I, I, I suspect that what she was trying to do was lay the groundwork um, so that she could then ask to be sealed to her children, but first she felt like she needed to be sealed to somebody to start with, if that makes sense. Um, was there another part, or did yeah. I? How did, did she leave any indication of what she would be like in eternity, like if she would have the same station as a regular Mormon? Or? Um, my expectation, my, my, my sense is that she thought that Yes, she would, she would go to heaven, um, she would be sealed, after 1894, she would be sealed to Joseph Smith as a servant, so she would be with Joseph Smith. Um, it, she never talks about that fully, um, so she doesn't give any indication. Um, Joseph F. Smith spoke at her funeral and talked about um, how she was going to be white in heaven. Um, so there's, uh, there is thinking going on about what that's going to look like, um, but she doesn't talk about it much. Yeah. Um, now, what are your thoughts on how this legacy of racism affects the church today in 2019, I guess? I think the church is still really working on this, right? Um, it, some of you probably saw the B1 celebration last year, um, or commemoration, I guess, would be a better word for that. Um, and I, I think this is an ongoing issue for the church. Um, so... Jane James's legacy, I think, is in, she becomes a kind of empty signifier in some ways. Um, talk about Jane really picked up around the early 2000s. Um, we don't see a lot of publishing about her from, you know, say 1910 until the 1960s. And then there's a sort of slow drip of things. And then in the 2000s, it becomes a gush. And I looked at that for a long time before I figured out what I think that's about, and I think it's actually about Joseph Smith. I think it's about his, the bicentennial of his birth was coming up in 2005, and talking about Jane became a way of talking about Joseph and sort of reimagining the history of the LDS church as always already diverse, as welcoming of people of other races. And Joseph Smith in these tellings becomes a somebody who is um, racially egalitarian, he's a prophet for the 21st century, right? Um, 
So I think Jane's story has been used to um, think about race in the church. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that hers is one story, right? And there are a lot of stories out there. So Paul Reeves' work, um, he's up at the University of Utah and working on a thing called Century of Black Mormons, which is online, centuryofblackmormons.org, I believe. Um, and it's cataloging all of the black people who joined the church from 1830 to 1930 um, and trying to sort of document their lives and their experiences. Um, and I think resources like that are a really valuable way of getting a much broader sense of what um, the experiences of black people in the church have been. Um, and I think that's really important because not all black people are African Americans from Connecticut like Jane, right? Um, and not all black people who joined the church are African American African Americans from Connecticut like Jane. Um, and so they end up having obviously a range of experiences and I think for um, non-black members of the church, it's really important to sit with that range and to sit with the enormous different varieties of pain that African American people and black people in the church have experienced. Um, and think about that and think about how to sort of understand um, and mitigate and repent and atone for that. So does that answer your question? Other questions? Yes, thank you. Sorry, it's dark back there. Yeah, so uh, let's be clear, I'm not a member of the LDS Church, and I never have been. Um, but you might say I'm an interested observer. Um, and I think you're right that it is really hard um, to sort of flip the script in a kind of way, right? Um, one of the things that I tried to do uh, in, this, in the book that I wrote was to stand with Jane to stand alongside her and sort of think about sort of how does she see what's going on around her? Because I think um, the instinct is to stand with the elite white men who are running the church, right? And so if we change the perspective, um, we start to see how things look different, right? And that is a way, I think, of kind of imagining ourselves into and a kind of empathetic relationship with people who maybe had less power um, to start to see the consequences of some of those decisions that really didn't have major consequences for the white men who were making those decisions, but had huge consequences for the people who had to live them out. So I think we're out of time. So thank you very much. Um, and I think I'm signing books out there. Uh, so grateful for Dr. Newell's time and effort today to be with us. Um, she is right. She, she can sign books if you